Amen. For us that are left, if you would, get your Bibles and stand with me and turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the scripture reads, It says, And now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered to, with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this evening, thanking you for another time of worship. Thank you for the songs that we've been able to sing, just that remind us of the truth, not only the gospel, but some other biblical truths, Lord, in which... Uh, things like you love us, we know that. You're with us, we know that. Uh, Lord Jesus, we're just thankful that we can lift up songs of praise into your high and holy name. And Lord Jesus, as we look to your word tonight, I ask again you'd hide me behind the cross. I ask for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit to preach your word here tonight. And I pray, Lord, as your word is proclaimed, that it would go out and it would uh, reach the ears and the hearts of those within the sound of my voice. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as it reaches our ears and our hearts, that it would fall upon ears that are hearing and listening and hearts that are willing to receive your word. So if there's someone lost, that tonight they would be saved. And Lord, for us who are saved, that we would respond to what the Spirit of God has to say to us through your word. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified and that you would be high and lifted up in this place and that you would draw men unto yourself. And may we take heed to the drawing presence of the Holy Spirit We'll give you the honor and glory tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Restoring the excitement of ministry. You know, sometimes as we live for the Lord Jesus, we get into the routine of living for him. And sometimes I think we just find ourselves in a rut. And one person described a rut as a grave with both ends kicked out of it. And I think that's a, probably a pretty good analogy of what a rut is. And I think sometimes in the life of a Christian, we can show up to worship services on a regular basis. We can attempt to be a part of ministry that is there in front of us. But if we're not careful, we can go through the routine and not really experience the joy of the Lord in the midst of ministry. I think Jesus addressed that issue with the church of Ephesus. I think he dealt with that in Revelation chapter 2 when he talked about the fact that the church of Ephesus had a pretty active ministry, but at the same time, they had left their first love. They were accustomed to doing what they did. They had the programs, they had the ministries, they had the word in which they stood upon. They even confronted the heirs of false teachers that were around them. Yet at the same exact time, they left their first love. And I think we have to guard against that in our own lives. So many times we think about folks who, who are just stopping ministry or folks who, who just began to find a place in a pew and, and no longer are doing much. And that's a problem. 
but we can also find ourselves not where we need to be even when we're in the middle of doing what we think we need to be doing. We need to get back to the excitement of ministry. And then look in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transition book between Old Testament and New Testament. It was a time when Jesus had already been crucified. He had already raised himself from the dead. He had been around for 40 days after his resurrection. He had made himself known to the apostles. He had made himself known to the women. He had made himself known to over 500 people at one time. He had been teaching them things. And then prior to his ascension to the right hand of the Father, he commissioned the disciples. He told them, first, he wanted them to go back to Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And as the Holy Spirit would come upon them, he would empower them and they would become his witnesses there in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And so the apostles went on back to Jerusalem like they were told and they were there in the upper room. And in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, while they were there in one accord, there was 120 of them up there in the upper room, and the Spirit of God fell upon them. And the Bible describes it as cloven tongues of fire that came in, and the Holy Spirit baptized them in the upper room, began to permanently indwell them, and he began to speak through them. And on that day, we're reminded that Peter preached a message that there was 3,000 people who got saved. Others were speaking, and they were speaking in languages that was not their native tongue. And those that were out there hearing Jews from different parts of the world that had came there to Jerusalem to observe the Passover and the other feast days, they heard the truth of the gospel and 3,000 of them trusted in Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, as the crucified one, and as the risen Savior. That was the fire that began there that spread throughout Jerusalem. 3,000 people got saved that day. They followed through in believers' baptism. And as they began to live out their Christianity, not as individuals, but as the church, God began to save folks on a daily basis that were there in their midst. It was an exciting time. It was such an exciting time that the Bible says that, that they gathered together. You know, I, I think about just a little bit earlier than where we're at tonight in the book of Acts chapter 2, we find here that these are some things that happened. It says in verse 41 of chapter 2 that they were gladly baptized. They were, those that le- received the word were gladly baptized It says there was 3,000 souls added to him. So you got 3,120 people there in the early church in Jerusalem. And it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The excitement was so fresh and new to them that they hungered for the word of God. You know what we got to get back to? The excitement to be under the word of God. It's time for the church to get back to a hungering and a desire for the Word of God. I remember when I first got saved, just being 18 years old, never really raised in church, didn't really know much about the Bible. And I remember when I got saved on September 20th of 98, and I followed the Lord in believer's baptism, and then I began to come to church. And I drove quite a pretty good little distance to get to the church where I was going at First Baptist Church, South Lebanon. And I showed up for Sunday school, and I remember when I first started going to Sunday school. I was 18 years old. And they came to me and they said, Anthony, would you like to go to the youth class? I just graduated. I said, the youth class? They said, yeah, there's some people that maybe have been closer to your age. I said, no, I think I'm fine in this adult class. Most of the adults in that class were probably 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 plus. And I said, no, I'll be fine right here. I wanted to learn the word. I wasn't coming there to be entertained, and I don't know what all they were doing with the youth at that time, but I was just a brand new Christian, and I said, no, I think I'm going to stay right here. And I couldn't wait to show up to Sunday school and listen to my Sunday school teacher. His name was Larry Brandenburg. He's gone to be with the Lord now, but he would teach the word of God, and I would go, and I would hunger and desire for that small group Bible study to learn more about the Scripture. And then I couldn't wait to get into the service and listen to the preacher preach the Word of God. 
I would take my Bible and I would follow him along and I would be pumped up and excited about what God had to say to me as an individual, what he was doing in our midst. I hungered for the word of God. And folks, it's time for us to get back to that hunger and that desire for the word of God. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. I've been saved for several years now. I've been saved for 20-some years now. I've been preaching for 20-some years. Been in the ministry and pastoring for almost 20 years. This isn't new to me at all, but the desire and the hunger for the Word of God should still be there. It should still be there. Some things should not get old. in the Scripture and the Word of God, the truth thereof, should still be exciting to us. We ought to have a desire to be. You know, the early church, there was a desire to be there at the word of God. And not only were they there to, to hunger and, and steadfast were the apostles' doctrine, but fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The church had a desire for ministry, not, not for one uh, of their own ministry, but personal ministry, but that they came together as a body, as a group of people called out by the Spirit of God, set aside for the work of the Lord Jesus, they desired and had an excitement to come together. You know what, folks? We need to get back to that desire. You know, the church is struggling. The church is struggling to assemble. And it's not just struggling to assemble because we've been dealing with a pandemic over the last year and a half. There's been a struggle to assemble for some time now. And all we've done with the pandemic that's been happening has seemed to give a pretty legitimate, at least people think it is, a legitimate excuse to stay at the house. We've already been having a problem with that. Prior to last year, prior to when things began to take off with this sickness and the coronavirus, folks, churches were already struggling. Numbers in attendance where worship service was down, baptism was down, making an impact in the community down. I mean, that's just the reality. It's time for the people of God to realize the importance of assembling together as the spiritual body of Christ and be excited about doing so. I mean, I remember when revivals was, uh, was a happening thing. I remember when there would be a week-long revival and folks would set aside their schedules for such a time as that. Do you, you know that that when you look at the trend today, no revivals happen very much. And if they do, we'll say, well, we're going to have a revival service from Sunday morning to Wednesday. And then, you know, it's got even, it's got worse than that. Sometimes they start having revival services. Now we're going to meet on Sunday mornings for five weeks in a row. We're going to have revival. What? Aren't you already supposed to be having worship services on Sunday morning? You know, uh, Bible schools. Bible schools are almost becoming a thing of the past in a lot of churches. The coronavirus has just pushed that off the, over the edge. But folks are already backing off. Some not having Bible schools at all. Some trying to push a week of Bible school in one day. Gathering to assemble. Churches went from three days a week and having services you know, one day a week or one service a week. Folks, these people gathered on a regular basis in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. They began to, to see God move in such a way, it says, that fear, reverence came upon every soul. You know, when, when we see God move, it ought to cause us to be excited, but we also ought to have reverential fear. It says that the apostles done many wonders and signs and miracles that took place, and it says there also all that believed were together and they had all things in common. They were excited about the word. They were excited about fellowship. They were excited about the, the, the work or to take care of each other. I mean, this was an excitement to show the love of Christ to those that were there. They were even willing to do, give sacrificially. It says they sold their possessions in verse 45 and their goods and they parted them to all men as they had as every man had a need. They continued daily, daily, that they go in one accord to the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. 
They were excited about going and gathering together in a place of worship. Now, this specific time, they went to the temple, you know, because the temple uh, represented the house of God in the Old Testament. And remember, we're talking about transition, so things didn't just happen like, boom, and you understand everything yet. They themselves made up the temple of the one true and living God. They were lively stones built together to make up the spiritual house of God. But they met at the temple, and what's so awesome about it, everything that was symbolic in the temple now came to life to them in the person and the works of Jesus, who is the Christ. Because all the things of the Old Testament were signs and wonders pointing to the work and the person of Jesus. Everything in the tabernacle, everything that went on to the temple, all the sacrifice, all of the, the different elements of the, that took place in the temple, all the artifacts of the temple, point of the person and the works of Jesus, and when they would go back, you know what? Those sacrifices that took place, those things, all of a sudden, those shadows and those types would come to life in the person, the works of Jesus. So they went back. They were, they were glad to be able to go. They were excited about that. They were excited in worship. They were praising God. They had favor with all people. The Bible says in verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I mean, they were excited, not just about what was going on in their little circle, but the fact that people were getting saved. You know what the church needs to get back? The excitement of ministry, at least the people getting saved and people being excited about that. I'm going to talk to you about getting back to the excitement of ministry. We think about getting excitement again in chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. I mean, when we talk about the excitement of ministry, and we already alluded to it before, but being with the people of God in the place of worship, we need to get back to that excitement. We ought to be excited about what's going on on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. We ought to be excited any time that we can gather together and assemble for the purpose of worship, the purpose of ministry. It's time to be excited, not to look at it as, oh, here we go again, got to go back to church. It's Sunday. This is just what we do. No. And I'm not telling you if that's how you feel that you should quit coming. When you have those feelings, when you have that, you know, type of, uh, you know, feeling about, ah, I'm just not feeling it today. It's not about your feeling. It's about pushing forward. It's about knowing that you should be doing what you know you should be doing, no matter how you feel about it. But we ought to be seeking God, saying, God, I want that, that, that same feeling or emotion or excitement that I once had when I first got saved. Don't you think that if you've been saved for, for some time now that you ought to be growing in your relationship with Jesus? Don't you think that your love for him ought to be deeper? Don't you think that worship ought to be deeper don't you think hearing from the Word of God ought to be deeper? Don't you think that it should be not just an emotional experience? When you first get saved, there's a lot of emotion involved, involved in that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think God understands that. I think that when a person first gets saved, they don't have a complete understanding of what it means to can be completely born again. I don't think they have that understanding, but there's a time of refreshing that happens by the presence of the Lord in our life, and it is an emotional experience too, But that helps us to be able to go forward in our walk as then we mature in the faith. And our love for him isn't just all pure emotion, a subjective feeling, but now we have also the objective truth to go along with that. And I don't think that you push your emotion aside by no means. But I think that that ought to be even, really your emotion should be greater with the objective truth of maturing in the faith of the Lord Jesus, as you grow in the knowledge of the Scripture, as you walk with Him, as you talk with Him, the more that you come to know Him. These folks were excited. Paul, I mean, Peter and John, they went up together to the temple in the ninth hour of prayer. They were excited to go to the place of worship. They were excited about their opportunity not only to fellowship with each other, but to commune with God. You know, I remember when I first got saved, and when I, I, was the, I was one of many that got saved at First Baptist Church, South Lebanon, in 1998, going into 1999. I can't remember an exact number, but I'm telling you, it seemed like every single Sunday somebody was getting saved. 
Somebody was joining the church. God was doing a work. God was speaking mightily. I was brand new Christian. And I, I, I sat in the front and I, I just listened to the preacher. I'd follow along with my Bible. I didn't know a whole lot, but I was listening. I was trying to soak it in. And God was moving in my way. And then when the service was over, I couldn't wait to come back later on that evening to what God had to say to me. When there was Sunday or Wednesday night, when there's opportunity to be here, you know, it wasn't just me showing up to Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. But even on my way there, I'd have the opportunity to flip on the radio and listen to different men like Chuck Swindoll or Tony Evans. And I would listen to these men and I would soak up what I could on the radio on my way from work to worship service. And then I'd get to worship service and I'd have a desire to hear again what God had to say. And, and I'd grow in my walk with Jesus. There was an excitement because God had done something in my life. And now I got to be a part of what he was doing. Folks, we have to have that hunger. Listen, even as a pastor, you have to strive sometimes to push through the mundane days of ministry and get over just, well, it's, here we go. Got to go preach today, you know? You know, here, here we got to go. I got to go show up again teaching the Sunday school lesson, you know? We have to push through that as a pastor to, to everybody else. We have to say, you know what? Step back for a minute. Just go back to what it was like before you got saved. Go back to what it was like when you got saved. Remember that experience in that time, and, and then remember that, hey, it's the same God that's working in our life today, and we ought to show up excited, expecting God to do a work. I think sometimes excitement is there because we don't have much expectation, you know? We don't have most, you know, that expectation. We're thinking, ah, we're going to go through the same thing. You know, we're going to sing the same songs. Are we going to, Brother Anthony's going to be the same guy up there preaching, you know, you know, and, and he's going to preach out of the Bible and, you know, it's going to be the same thing we're accustomed to. But folks, <laughs> you know what? I don't think that the same old story gets old. I don't think the book uh, gets old. I don't think those old hymn songs get old. I think... I think that there's some new songs that, that are very good as well. But I think that worship doesn't get old. I think that when we come and we focus upon what Jesus did, I mean, when we think about singing, Jesus loves me, you know, I, when, I, when I've been saved not, not too long, I didn't know that Jesus loved, you, loved me was even in hymn book. I mean, because I wasn't raised in church. I just heard a little kid singing it. But when you start reading in all those different verses in that song, I mean, that's a pretty powerful song, folks, you know? And, and, and who doesn't like to go back and think about the positive things that happen in your childhood? Most people, when they start getting older, think, man, I wish I didn't wish my days away when I was a young person, right? I mean, how many of us are, I can't wait till I'm 13, then I can't wait till I'm 16, then I can't wait till I'm 18, and next thing you know, you're thinking, I wish I'd go back till I was 13. I wish I'd go back till I was 16. I wish I'd go back when I was 18. You know, we start thinking about the fact that Jesus loved us. I mean, that was, there were some exciting times as a kid. And I didn't have it easy growing up. And I'm telling you, I go back and think about that. Well, when I first got saved, I was a baby in Christ. There was a lot of excitement that was happening in my life. And very quick things were happening in my life. God began to show me his word. It was shortly after I was saved that he called me to preach. And then I had the opportunity to be involved in ministry. And then all of a sudden I went from there to Bible college. I mean, I've been graduated from Bible college 14, 15 years ago. 16, I don't even remember now. It's been so long ago. You know, it's pretty amazing. And I think about coming down southeastern Kentucky and being excited. And first time I preached down here was Onita Baptist Institute. Had the opportunity to preach uh, over there at Rock Castle County at that high school and going over there to Alice Lloyd College and preaching there and preaching revivals in West Virginia and Indiana and going to Tennessee and preaching and going back to Ohio and preaching and preaching in, in Kentucky and, and, and so on and so forth. And then the first time I got to go on a mission trip, I'll never forget that, going to Honduras and then later going off to Africa and then going to Haiti. I'll never forget. I'll never forget the, the opportunity to first pastor a church where I was at in Bell County. I mean, those were exciting times. And, and you know what? God's still moving today. In the midst of some difficult times, 
We serve a God who is still alive, who's still away, who's still well, who's still in the saving business, who still wants to do a work in the midst of difficult times. But I'm telling you what's going to have to happen. We're going to have to be excited about ministry again. You know? I mean, folks, there's opportunities. There's opportunities to do ministry and live for Jesus, but we've got to be excited about that. You know, we need to be excited about that, about what Christ has done in our life. Peter and John, they went up together in the beautiful, into the temple and the hour of prayer was being the ninth hour. Well, they were excited about it. You know, they, they went on a regular basis. Not only they were excited about going, but they were excited about the opportunities. I mean, look what it says in verse 2. There was a certain man that was lame from his mother's womb who was who, who from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which was called beautiful, to ask of alms of them that entered into the temple. Who sang Peter and John about to go in the temple, ask an alms, and Peter, fastening eyes, his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Peter and John weren't just excited about going to the temple during the time of prayer, that fellowship with God, but they also were excited about the opportunities that was in front of them for ministry. When they, when they went up there, they weren't just going there from a selfish standpoint. They weren't just going out of their own, you know, tradition as Jewish men, you know, to show up to the, to the, to the temple for a time of prayer. That was something they may have been accustomed to doing before. But when Jesus changed their life forevermore and the Holy Spirit moved upon them in the upper room, going to the temple meant something completely different. It was completely fulfilling to see all of that was fulfilled in the personal works of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the crucified one, the risen Savior, the one who had called them out in the ministry and gave them a special calling as apostles who are going to be part of the foundation of the church and they were seeing that come to pass. From 120 in the upper room to 3,120 to now people are being saved on a daily basis. I mean, they were looking for the opportunities of ministry. They were excited about what God was doing. Do you know why the church is struggling to see people saved, to see people baptized, to see the place full? You know why? Lack of excitement amongst the believers. I mean, why in the world would a lost person want to come to a place of worship if the so-called saved people ain't too excited about being here? Huh? You know how many times that uh, and I've shared with you with this before, but I, I've been in church as a pastor, and and, and I, folks that show up visiting, and they'd say, "Oh, so and so invited me to come to church. Are they here?" And I'm embarrassed, like, uh, "Not today, they ain't." <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm not sure when they invited you, but they evidently weren't sure or didn't think you was gonna come because they didn't show up. You know what kind of impression that is? Do Do you know? That, that when, when, when folks out there in the world who need to come to know Jesus as their own Savior and we're supposed to be the ones pointing them to Jesus when we ain't too excited about it, they ain't going to be too excited about it. They ain't going to be too excited about it. They ain't going to hear nothing about it. Lost people have no desire for the things of God, folks. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, but they only hear the Word of God from folks who know Christ. It's so what's important. I mean, just your presence, just your consistency is an important thing, but there needs to be some excitement with it. Do you also know that in the ministry, I've learned why a lot of family members of people who come to church on a regular basis stay lost and in their sin? You know why? Because some of the biggest critics of the church are believers that attend. I remember meeting some people at church that said, Brother Anthony, pray for my family. I can't get my husband or I can't get my wife or I can't get my kids to come to church. You know, it didn't take me very long to figure out why. You know, you know why? Because the first time they had a gripe, you know who they went and talked to? Their spouse, their kid. 
You know who's tearing down the body of Christ? Them. Why in the world would your lost loved one want to come to the church? That's all you've got to say about negative. You know? There ain't no excitement there. I mean, it, you know, does it make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. When you go to buy a vehicle and you go to a car salesman, guess what they're going to tell you? That's the best thing you ever got in. And they might be lying through their teeth. But if they ain't excited about the car that, they try, that you're trying to buy, you probably ain't going to buy it unless you've already done your research, unless you already had sold that car to yourself. But if you're going there just looking and not sure, and somebody can't convince you, that's, hey, that's the best vehicle, you probably ain't going to buy it. You know, or you go somewhere and, and somebody's a fan of somebody. Listen, you know, it's like Aiden. We went to a pitching practice for Annabelle, and Aiden went with Annabelle one day. I wasn't there that night, and he was there with her, and Julie was there. And, and this fella had a Cincinnati Bengals flag hanging up, and he had a Pittsburgh Steelers flag hanging up. I was proud of my boy. You know why? He looked at that guy, and he said, what are you doing hanging a Pittsburgh Steelers flag Next to the Bengals flag. What's wrong with you? That don't even make sense. And I was proud of him. I thought, burn that Pittsburgh Steeler flag down, you know? But I was proud of him for it, you know? It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. Do you know what? It don't make any sense for us to claim to be saved, to claim to be washing the blood, to claim to be going to heaven, to claim to have the Spirit of God inside of us, to claim to have the inspired and errant and infallible word of God, to know we have eternal life, all these truths. Yeah, we ain't got no excitement about it. You know, does it make any sense? It makes no sense. It's time for us to get back to the excitement and look for the opportunities of ministry. I mean, when they were going to the beautiful the gate of the temple and they were going to the hour of prayer, when they were on their way, there happened to be a lame man who was laid there every single day asking of alms because there wasn't the same type of, of SSI like we got today. There was no real help for that person, and so they had to ask. And so they laid him there every day. That lame man asking, you got any change to spare? You got anything to spare? Did Peter and John turn their head from him? Did they... Ignore what he had to say? No. No, they seen an opportunity. And they were excited about the opportunity. As they were on their way up there, they saw that they were seen first by this man. They began to ask, were ask of alms, but Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John. So they looked over there, and then they said to that man, look on us. Look on us. And they gave he, he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. They thought he would get silver or gold, but Peter responded and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He looked for an opportunity. You know, this past year we went down to Montgomery, Alabama, and we stayed uh, in a place there and close to where the ball field was as we were going to play with Annabelle. And, and we stayed in this hotel. And the first day that we were there, there was this fellow in a wheelchair. Shows up in a wheelchair, and he's outside of there. He's got one and a half legs. Part of his legs amputated. And he comes up, and he's just, you know, he's asking me, sir, I've been staying outside. You know, you, can, you got a little bit, a bit of money that I'm trying to be able to, you know, get a place to stay for tonight. And, and so, I mean, I've been there. I've seen a lot of folks asking. And so I gave them a little bit of money. and I have a whole lot of cash on me. Normally, don't carry any much cash. So I gave them a little bit of money and uh, went about my business that day. Well, as I was there, I guess he figured most people at the hotel, they were there that one night, and then they would leave. But we were there for a few days. So I seen him again. And he didn't say anything to me that day, and I seen him. And then I seen him inside the hotel lab lobby and where we stayed. Breakfast was free, as well as if you come that evening around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, they also had a free dinner. And so I seen him in there. I know he wasn't staying there. And I seen him creeping in his wheelchair. And he got behind a post where nobody could see him, the people working there. 
And then when he had opportunity, he would wheel his way in there and he'd get him some food and then he'd eat and then he'd try to sneak his way out of there. Earlier, I have seen him over the gas station across the road and he was kind of into it with the owner of the gas station. The owner of the gas station accused him of stealing and so on and so forth. So when I seen him in the hotel again, I said, I'll be back. And I seen him sneak out, and I went after him. I said, hey, man, how you doing? What's your name? Uh, he told me his name. And I began to talk to him. And I began to share the gospel with him. He claimed to already have a relationship with Jesus. And I told him, I said, you know you're in here stealing. You know that. He just kind of hung, hung his head down. And I said, I don't know what's going on exactly, but I know that you were over there in that gas station over there, and that guy accused you of stealing. And I know that you're hanging out with somebody else over there because you were on a cell phone talking to him. And I heard that mouth that you were using. And I started just telling him about Jesus and the love of Christ and so on and so forth. Like, he, like I said, he claimed I already have a relationship with Jesus, but I shared with him the truth of the gospel. I wasn't just trying to give him a hard time. I wanted to share with him the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because the truth is Jesus changes lives. He changes lives. And he could change that man's circumstance. You know, that man could be forever changed if he would surrender to the Lord Jesus as Savior, commit to him as a servant of the Lord and a master, and let Jesus do work in his life. And we have to see the opportunities of ministry. Do you know when, when we're right here, I mean, right here at Victory Baptist Church on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, we, we have a blessed opportunity to pour our lives into some young people. You know, it's not always easy. Sometimes you want to pull out the hair. And I don't even have much hair to pull out. It's the weirdest thing. The more that my hair grows, the less I realize I have. And so I go get a haircut. Because, and you pull it out. You get frustrated sometimes. But let me tell you something. There's opportunities in our own kids and then these other kids that are here and up and down these streets and these homes and the places of our, our workplace, uh, the out there in the stores, there's opportunities if we'll just be excited about ministry and looking for ministry, you know? Instead of having our heads down all the time, going from point A to point B to try to get to our house, to try to just relax, we need to realize as we're going through life, God has placed us here to serve him, which then entails serving others. We got to get excited about ministry. Peter said, look on us. Look on us. Now, maybe we don't have silver and gold to fix everybody's financial problem. Jesus said the poor is always going to be with you. I understand that. You're not going to feed every mouth. You're not going to clothe every person. You're not going to house every person. You're not going to be able to fix every ailment. Not every disease is going to be cured and healed. You know, it didn't happen in Jesus' day. It's not going to happen today. But what God does desire is for all men to be saved. And when saved people come to know Jesus, guess what? He then begins to work out the other issues in their life. And whether it's, you know, helping them with sickness, whether it's taking care of some other needs that they have, but at the end of the day, this place is temporary. Heaven's forever and hell's forever, and our job is to win those that are lost to Christ. Bring the lost sheep to the good shepherd. And we ought to be excited about the opportunity of ministry because God has blessed us with the opportunity to be about his service. We got to get excited again about gathering in the place of worship, excited about the opportunities of ministry. I mean, look at the life that was changed. There was a man who every day, he was, from his mother's womb, was he lame? And then as they got to a certain bed, they began to lay him down. Probably when the time he was a baby, they showed up with him. Probably didn't leave the baby laying there, of course, but ask for help from the time that he came in the world. And then as he got bigger and turned into a grown man, they would lay him out there by himself for him to be able to ask. But when he had an encounter with Peter and John, who had the power of Christ, this man was forever changed. Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I'll give unto you, as he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
rise up and walk. And he took him by his right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. He was leaping, and he stood, and he walked, and he entered in to the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Folks, when Jesus changes lives, you begin to realize it's worth it all. When you see people forever change, I know there's a lot of disappointment in ministry. I've been in a long time. I mean, there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows in ministry. There are times you get super excited. You see people get saved. You see lives get changed. You see people come on fire for Christ. And then you see some other times where it's like, man, what is going on? You know, it's amazing. You know, there's highs and lows in it, but I'm going to tell you something. You know, no matter what the low is, no matter what the low is in ministry, seeing Jesus change somebody's life, it's worth it. It's worth it. If it's one person, if it's one person that you're able to influence to come to know Jesus and they're forever changed and they begin to serve the Lord, guess what? You get to be a part of the ripple effect because that person is going to end up influencing somebody who's going to give their life to Jesus. And it's all started because you impacted their life. Somebody had to lead Billy Graham to the Lord. Somebody had to lead D.L. Moody to the Lord. Somebody had to lead Charles Spurgeon to the Lord. Somebody had to lead whatever great preacher you're talking about to the Lord or some great woman of God of the Lord or some deacon or some Sunday school teacher. Somebody had to lead them to the Lord before they could have a great impact that God was doing. And if you and I will see that we could be a part of that and the ripple effect that could ultimately change not just one person, but whole communities. Whole states, whole world. We got to be excited about it. We got to get back to being excited about what God's doing. I mean, look what goes on. I mean, they were excited not just about going to, to, to a place of worship, they got excited about the opportunity of ministry. But then they got excited seeing it spread. It says, all the people saw him walking and praising God and they knew that it was he that sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement that which had happened unto him. It goes on to say in verse 11, as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch. It was called Solomon's greatly wondering and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? You know what Peter seen? Peter seen and was excited about the ministry continuing to spread. Oh, he, he was excited about showing up for prayer. But look what happens when you're excited just to be in the presence of Jesus with other believers to worship and to pray. Guess what happens? It goes from that, the opportunity to ministry. You minister to one person, then all of a sudden, boom. Boom. And Peter says, why are y'all so amazed? Why, why are y'all looking on us as if it was our own power, our own holiness? You know what they were excited about? Pointing people to Jesus. You know what we got to get excited again about? Pointing people to Jesus. That's what it's about, folks. That's what it's about. You know why the church is struggling? This is why they're struggling. Because our excitement isn't about pointing people to Jesus. You know what, we've, you know what we have bought into? The lie that that's not enough. You know, oh man, we've, we've, got, we've got some new song ministry. Come out to Victory Baptist Church. We've got a new preacher. Come out to Victory Baptist Church. We've got a new program. Come out to Victory Baptist Church. No. You know what's going to happen to the new music ministry? It's going to get old. You know what's going to happen to the new preacher? He's going to get old. You know what's going to happen to the new program? It's going to get old. 
You know what? Don't get old. Point people to Jesus. They don't get old, folks. It's an old, old story, but it still has brand new effects on people's lives. You know what we got to be excited about? Pointing people to Jesus. That's what we got to be excited about. You know what? The, the more messed up with the word, the church has bought into the lie that that's not sufficient. That's absolutely sufficient. That's the only thing that is sufficient. Peter and John understood that. I mean, they could have let that go to their head big right then, but they didn't. Peter and John, why are y'all looking at us? And then he began to preach. Oh, he didn't water it down either, did he? I mean, a big congregation hanging around. I mean, that'd be huge. 5,000 people got saved that day. He didn't worry about if he was going to run them off. He didn't do that. He started, why are you standing here amazed at what's going on? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you, he says, delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. I tell you what, he ain't. He ain't one of them skinny jeans sitting on a stool looking at a screen type preacher. Hello? Salt and pepper in a verse here and there. Peter shucked the corn. Peter called a spade a spade. Peter called it as it was. And when he said, why y'all so amazed when, when y'all are the ones who denied Jesus, who delivered him up, and when he was going to be let go, you were determined to make sure he was the one who was going to be crucified. I mean, you start going on. I mean, he called, he called us this. You know why? Because before you can receive the good news, you got to know the bad news. So what did he do? Ultimately, he seen the opportunity for lost people to be saved. But in order for a lost person to be saved, we got to know they're lost. For a sinner to be bought by the blood of the Lamb, they got to understand they're in a debt that they cannot pay. It goes on to say here, he said, you denied the Holy One, the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Guess what? They were thinking backwards then like we think backwards today. Think about that. Julie was reading me. I don't, I don't know who the preacher is. I don't know what church he is. He's bishop so-and-so, supposedly of some Baptist church. I didn't, I didn't even get the guy's name. I didn't get the church's name because um, I didn't want it to be the sole Topic of my sermon this morning or tonight. In fact, I forgot about this morning until just now. But to go to that guy's church, you're going to have to show your vaccine card. Hello? And, and, and if you, you know, if you don't want to show the vaccine card, then you're more than welcome to, to continue to attend the uh, whatever live media stream they have. I'm like, what? This guy here says, I'm pro I'm pro-life, except for three things: for rape, for incest, and for the health of the mother. I said, then tell everybody you ain't pro-life, you're pro-choice. But I mean, the, the, the guy's backwards. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. We live in a backwards culture and a backwards society, but no more backwards than what Peter was dealing with. He said, y'all wanted a murderer and gave up the one who gives life. Does that make any sense? I mean, look what he says. You killed the prince of life, but God raised him up. The father raised him up from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith, in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him that given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that through the ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers, 
but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. You did what you did, but you did it in accordance to the plan of God. And he says, therefore, repent. Look at that. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Look what it says. And then a time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, liken unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. As you go on to read here, he continues to preach, and then people got saved. Folks, we got to be excited about gathering, excited about the opportunity of ministry, and the excitement of the move of God and the bigger things as the word is spread. Hey, we need to get excited again. It's time to get excited again. You know? And I'm not talking about just conjuring up some emotional experience. But I think some emotion needs to be brought back to it. I mean, it's not spiritual to sit there like a bump on the log thinking, bless me if you can. Hey, one thing exciting... Or, or, or spiritual, rather, about looking like for breakfast, we suck it on lemons. Ain't one thing spiritual about that, you know? And I'm not saying that you got to run the top of the pew. I'm not saying you got to take off like this as a track meet, run around this building. I think some things are completely chaotic. I don't even think some of that stuff is biblical whatsoever. People say, well, worship as you want to. That ain't what the Bible says, folks. We got to come to him as he wants us to come to him. But I can tell you what he wants. He don't want us sitting there like we ain't never been saved, like we ain't been delivered from hell, like we ain't going to heaven, like we ain't washed in the blood, like we ain't been adopted into the family, like we ain't been part of the ministry, like we ain't got the spirit in us, like we ain't got the word given to us. Folks, we ought to be excited about what Jesus has done and what he's doing. Time for us to get excited again. But that's going to come down to you. You, as an individual, got to make that decision. You know? You got to make that decision. How are you going to respond? You know? Because you're going to have to take, what's it take for that? You know? A lot of times we think, man, I, I just, I just wasn't feeling it today. I just want a good service today. Why not? My preacher didn't preach his best sermon. Uh, you hang around long enough, you'll figure that out. You know? I had a song service today. Just wasn't, just, just didn't, just didn't do nothing for me today. You know? You know what? Jamie leads us in songs. And he, and he, and he, he, I think he ought to be prepared just like I ought to be prepared to help lead in a time of worship. Let me tell you something, folks. Brother Jamie can't get you ready. Brother Anthony can't get you ready. Miss Gwen or anybody else playing an instrument can't get you ready. If that's what you're depending upon, well, you've got problems, folks. Well, we ought to be able to start being ready based on our walk with Jesus. Not based on anything else. You know? We ought to come here ready and prepared based on our relationship with Jesus and our desire to grow and be more like him and, and, and to become closer to him. That's why we ought to be excited. Excitement ought to be there. I, I remember... Just like anything else, I remember going to a ball game one time, Reds game. I'm a big Reds fan. I like the Reds. I like Cincinnati Bengals, you know. 
and, and they terrible sometimes, but I still like them. And I still get pumped up about it. And I, if I go somewhere, I have fun. And I get pumped up, excited about it. One time I was at a Reds game, I was cheering the whole game. Just me and Julie there. I didn't even know nobody else around there. Pumped up, excited about it. And this guy reached over. He says, hey, super fan, what are you drinking? Why are you drunk or skunked? I said, uh, he won't buy me a drink. I said, how about a Gatorade? Well, I ain't buying you. You ain't drinking nothing. No, I don't have to have alcohol to have a good time. You know what it is? I just am a fan, and I'm going to cheer them on. I'm going to holler them, and I'm going to heckle the other team. I'm going to have a good time. Because what I when I come to church, I'm going to tell you something. When I come to worship service, I learned a long time as a pastor. I learned a long time as a pastor that my desire for worship and excitement to be here is not going to be based on who's here or who's not here, who's singing, who ain't singing, what else is going on. I've come to realize that my motivation needs to be in the fact that the one true and living God who is above all, he came down to me, a wretched old sinner deserving to go to hell, and he reached down, and he saved me and changed me. That causes me to get excited to want to worship him. You know? It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about him. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to be excited about the Lord. If anybody else thinks I'm crazy, you know? I remember even one time it doesn't matter to me, no matter what anybody else thinks. And I went to a Bengals game. It was cold. AJ was just born. I mean, he wasn't big as nothing. I say just born. He was probably six, seven months, eight months old, nine months. He may have been close to a year, but he wasn't here yet. And we went up to Cincinnati to go to a ball game. Me, Julie, and the baby. And it started this cold, rainy stuff. And Julie said, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to the Bengals game. If y'all want to come, you can come. If you worried about getting the baby out there in the weather, you can stay at the hotel. I'm going to the Bengals game. So she came. She brought the baby to the Bengals game. We were in the end zone. We were sitting up there surrounded by a bunch of idiots again. I didn't know who they were. And where you go, you're surrounded by idiots. That's all right. I don't, I don't participate in that. But it was like a third down. And they said, this guy reached, he starts to get everybody around. He says, it's raining, snowy, it's, it's nasty. He says, if they hold them, take your shirts off. Well, he's talking to the guys, okay? And Julie looks at me and she says, don't you dare. So I had a hold of my shirt like this right here. And they didn't hold them. And I said, Phew. But then it came a fourth down. And that guy said, if they hold them, take your shirts off. And Julie looked at me and she said, you better not look like one of them idiots. Somebody will see you and they're going to think you're like that. Well, they held him, and I jerked my shirt off because I was pumped up and crazy. Not because I was drunk. Not because, of, because I was a crazy, excited fan. Well, now I'm not telling you to jerk your shirt off here at church. I'm not telling you to be all crazy like that, but what I am telling you is this. You and I ought to be pumped up and excited about what Jesus is, who he is, what he's doing, and what he wants to do in our midst. We ought to be excited about it, folks. I've seen it too, too much. Same folks that show up to church. I don't know what it's like over in Laurel County. I've been to many ball games here. But I'm going to tell you, over in Clay County, you go to elementary school games. It's the craziest group of people that you've ever seen in your life. I promise you that. When I first went over there and I sat down, I mean, the, the athletic director was like, you get out of hand, you're going to jail. I'm like, man, it's an elementary game. But that was the ride because it's crazy. That's crazy. But the same people that look like bumps on the log on Sunday act like pure maniacs at elementary ball game. I don't understand it, folks. I don't understand it. It's time for the church to get excited again. 
Well, I mean, it, it ain't gonna hurt. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't try to get them in that way, Susie. Yeah. No, do not. That'd be the only thing people heard when they left here. Go to Victory Baptist Church, jerk his shirts off. No, that ain't what I'll say. That's not what I'm saying. But being excited for Jesus won't hurt. It will not hurt the cause. But I can tell you this. If you ain't got no excitement for Jesus, there ain't going to be no convincing them out there in the world that they need Jesus. Later on, in chapter 4, Peter plainly state this as they told him, you're going to shut up. You're going to shut up. You're going to quit. We can't deny what happened, but y'all no longer can go and preach and teach in the name of Jesus any longer. And Peter said, if y'all think that's what we should do, fine. But all we know to do is what we have seen and what we've heard. Peter was convinced and Peter was excited and Peter didn't care about the threat anymore. Folks, we ought to be that excited. So excited we ought to be. And we're going to tell Jesus, about, tell about Jesus no matter what. What about you tonight? Where's your excitement? Where's your excitement? We get excited about a lot of things. And ain't wrong with getting excited about things. But what about Jesus? What about Jesus? You know, does he get you excited? Does he stir you? You know, you're motivated by him. Gathering for worship, gathering for fellowship, looking for the opportunity to ministry, excited about the potential of the lives that can be changed through the truth of the gospel. What about you tonight? What about us collectively as a church? You know, what about us collectively? Under the head of Jesus, of one heart, of one mind, of one accord, filled by the Spirit of God, empowered to go do the work of the ministry. Man, what a thought of what could happen in the lives of folks in our community. Jesus worth getting excited over, folks. What about you tonight? I'm going to ask Brother Jamie to come. And those are going to help with the invitation as they make their way. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight, telling you we love you. We're excited tonight, know I am, about what you've done in my life. I'm excited about what you've done in the life here at Victory Baptist Church since you allowed me to be a part almost four years ago. And Lord Jesus, we've had some ups and some downs. We've seen some really exciting things. Lord, we've went through different things. It's been difficult. Um, and Lord, you've been faithful. Lord, you've brought us a long way. You're still doing the work. And I'm excited about what you continue to do. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would rekindle our hearts, stir us, and we get excited again. May we have that same excitement when we first got saved that hunger for your word, that desire for worship and fellowship, that want to tell others about what you did in, did in our lives and what you want to do in their lives. Oh, may we be excited. Lord Jesus, if we have kind of gotten the rut, we've left our first love, we've just been going through the motions, Lord, may we ask your forgiveness. May we repent. May we return to our first love. May you do a work in our lives here tonight because there's a great potential for you to do great things here and spread abroad. I ask you to move during this invitation. May we respond to you during this time. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.